we derived the Fermi Dirac and the Bose Einstein distribution uh, from scratch. And then we looked at the classical limit. So when the concentration is low or the temperature is high. And um, looking at that distribution, which looks a little bit like that, uh, we were able to derive yet again uh, the properties of the ideal gas. So the uh, the free energy from the free energy you can get um, everything. So today we're going to look at a few. You might call them corner cases, but um, I think a better way to think about them is like orthogonal vectors uh, in math, right? Like i, j, and k. Um, pretty much um, a lot of situations uh, are going to be combinations of these cases. Okay, so the first one is, um, okay, so the title is, Ideal monoatomic gas expansion. This is the kind of the title of the lecture. And the cases that we're going to look at, the first one is reversible isothermal uh, expansion. So we have uh, isothermal means that the temperature is kept constant. How do you keep the temperature constant of a system? By putting it in contact with a, uh, with a reservoir that is much bigger than itself, well, than the system. So, here we're going to have, this is a pretty cool thought experiment that they have in Kittel and Cromer. You have your gas over here. Uh, there's heat that can flow in or out if necessary of the system. And this is a and there are some weights over here. So, you know, the size of these weights are, is really small. And so you can remove them little by little. And in a way that the gas is always in thermodynamic equilibrium. What's gonna happen when you remove one of these weights? Mm -hmm. Why? Because you're putting in heat and there's an expansion. So yes. you remove the weight. So there's less pressure on the gas, right? So the gas is going to adjust to the new pressure. So it's going to move up to decrease its pressure. And you're right, the heat flows in. And so it can keep its temperature. So it will. Um, expand without any problems. All right, so since it is always in thermodynamic equilibrium, that means that it is always in its most probable configuration. The volume is going to change. Um, from V1 to V2. And 
this figure is figure 6.7 in detail and Cromer. Okay, so the pressure uh, times the volume in this system is um, number of particles times the temperature. So that's one of the formula that we derived. So that means that um, the number of particles is constant. The temperature is also constant because of the heat that is able to flow in. So this product, the pressure times the volume, is a constant. So it means that P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2. And from here, it's easy to see that the pressure is lower at lower volume. All right, so P2 will be um, V1 over V2 times P1. And V2 is larger because it is expanding. So this is less than one. So the pressure at the second state or final state is going to be less than um, at the beginning. That makes sense because, well, it is just trying to cancel out the weight that was removed. And then the entropy. What is the entropy? Number of particles, natural log of the quantum concentration divided by the concentration plus five halves. Right, so uh, Sukar tetrod. <laughs> Okay, so in the, the quantum concentration over here is the mass of the particle times the temperature divided times two pi h4 squared to the three halves. And the regular concentration is the number of particles divided by the volume. So the quantum concentration is going to change. No, right. The only thing that might change is the temperature. And the temperature remains the same because the heat can flow in and out. So the quantum concentration doesn't change. Um, what about the, the regular concentration? Yeah, that one does change because it depends on the volume and the volume changes. So we can rewrite this one. If we can put the volume over here and divide by the number of particles. Um, and then we can separate the end cube, which doesn't change, and the volume, which does change. And that one so will be. Log 
of the volume as natural log of n cube with natural log of n as three halves, I mean uh, two halves. So all of this is a constant. The only thing that changes is the natural log of the volume. So if we do entropy of two minus entropy of one, we will get rid of uh, everything uh, in here um, because it will be the same with the concentration number of particles and two fifths. So this is going to be n. log of v2 minus natural log of v1. So we can just put that as um, So that is equation uh, detail and Cromer 6.56. And what we learn from this equation is that the entropy is what? at lower volume. Entropy is lower at lower volume. Entropy is larger. So V2 is greater than V1. Does that make sense? Why? There's more state available to the system, right? The phase space is larger, so the entropy is larger. So, the pressure, the entropy. Now we're going to let's take a look at the work. And it might be a little bit confusing just to be consistent. What does work on what? So in this case, the work done against the piston. What is doing that work? The expanding gas, right? So work done on the piston is gonna be W. That means that the work done by the gas is minus W. So, Work them uh, against the piston by gas. What is the work? PDV. Uh, from volume one to volume two. And uh, PDV, we know what it is. 
Um, well, actually, mm, we know what PV is. It's n tau. So the pressure as a function of the volume is n tau divided by the volume. Okay, so integral from V1 to V2 of n tau um, over V, dV, but the number of particles and the temperature is constant, are constant. So then the work is n tau integral from v1 to v2 dv over v. What is that integral? Yes. Okay, never mind. Natural log of B. Right. From B1 to V2. So uh, we can subtract this one. So it's going to be V2 divided by V1. And that one is equation six point sixty fifty seven. And this one over here, I guess, minus the um, N and minus the T was the entropy. So the work is tau, and then the change in the entropy. So that's kind of a cool one. No pun intended. So the work uh, depends only on the change in the volume, this to our constant, that is the change in the entropy. So this is a pretty clean relationship for the uh, isothermal case. And so the work done by the gas is gonna be what? Okay, I'm going to move this one. So the internal energy of the gas is going to be what? Three halves of n tau, right? This is just the ideal gas uh, law. Uh, both n and tau are fixed. So what is the change in the internal energy. Zero. Yeah, thank you. So if the internal energy is not changing and the system is doing work, where is the energy coming from? The energy to do work. So from the thermodynamic identity, we have uh, tau d sigma equals du minus PdV. 
uh, sorry, plus PTP. So if the change in the energy is zero, that means that the work done by the gas is equal to tau d sigma. What is tau d sigma, also known as AKA? Q, capital Q, so the, the heat. And so this is the work done on the piston. So the work done by the gas is minus um, PDV, so that negative work. So that means that Q plus W is zero. Okay, so this is just the first law of thermodynamics. So conservation of energy. All right. I bet you already knew all of this. Did you? No? Did you see it in 22, whatever? No? Okay. Never mind. Did you see it, Fatima? Have you seen this before? Something like that? Mm hmm okay so the next one is um put this one over here reversible isentropic So uh, typically isentropic is going to be called uh, adiabatic. Adiabatic means that no heat flows in or out. So while that is correct, that heat doesn't flow in and out, isentropic is a better term because we're focusing on the fact that the entropy remains the same. So we have our drawing again. We have the weights, the gas over here. But now instead of um, connecting this um, system to a reservoir, we're going to just um, leave it next to an insulator. Okay, so no heat can flow in or out. You remove the weight, one of them, what is gonna happen? Well, it's going to expand. Uh, you can get that maybe from the name. But also, you know, there's less pressure because you remove the weight. So the gas is going to um, um, equilibrate. So the, the, the volume is going to increase. Um, but in the other case, the reservoir kept the temperature constant. What is going to happen to the temperature in this case? Right, you know, this is very uh, intuitive. Okay, so the entropy in this case, it's still the ideal gas, 
So it is still given by um, this equation. Uh, oh, five. Um, the quantum concentration is m tau over 2 pi h bar squared to the 3 halves. Is the quantum concentration going to change? Yes. Yes, we have a temperature over there, right? So it changes. What about the volume? Yes. Volume also changes. Um, what about the number of particles? No. That one remains constant, right? It's not, um, it's an isolated uh, system. So then we can rewrite the entropy as N. Natural log of tau to the three halves. So taking uh, taking it out of the uh, uh, quantum concentration. Natural log of the volume. Natural log of the rest of the quantum concentration. Um, and then the n. Since we it was over here in this line, so minus the natural log of the number of particles plus five halves. So all of these is constant, but these two change. So plus constant. Okay, so when we take the difference, the constant is going to cancel out. They are exactly the same for both cases. Um, so we're gonna have, yeah, I guess I should put the whole thing. Natural log of T2 to the three halves minus natural log of T1 to the three halves plus um, natural log of B2 minus natural log of B1. That's equal to what over here? Well, it is isentropic. So the quantity that we are not changing over here is the entropy. So the change in entropy is zero. So we can rearrange those terms to get um, eventually, well, there's only like one step in there, but T1 to the three halves V1 equals tau two to the three halves V2. Uh, that one is equation. And what it's telling us is that the temperature uh, temperature Um, for V2, this is less than one, it's a fraction. So the temperature at the end is lower. 
structure is lower at Yeah, I think so. All right. So we know that PV equals n tau. So uh, can divide by V over here. And we have uh, this relationship, we can rewrite it as um, tau one over tau two to the three halves equals V2 minus V1. So we can take you know, this one to the two thirds. And this one is just to the one. Right, so that is the, the ratio between the two temperatures. So P2 divided by P1 is n tau two over v two divided by n tau one over v one. The n's cancel out, and so we can put the v one over here and the tau one over here. And that is the ratio of the pressures. So mm, this one, I guess, is the opposite. So it's going to be V1 over V2. Mm, V1 over V2 to the 2 thirds. So we can put the Vs in there. So this is gonna be to the five thirds now, we have three. So that is the ratio of the pressures. Right, so special cases. Mm. So this is equation 6.65. And what we tell us, what it tells us is that the pressure is lower at larger volume. Which it's also intuitive. And since the well, PV equals NT, we can also get um, so the other relationship. I'm just going to write it over here. Is uh, tau one to the five halves divided by P1 equals tau two to the five halves divided by P2. Uh, 
All right. So now, if you wanna check out the work, what is the work done, let's say, by the piston? No, I mean against the piston. Integral of P dV from V1 to V2. Do you agree with that? So in this case, the relationship between the pressure and the volume is more complicated. Um, so I'm going to put it over here. We got that P1, V1 to the five thirds is equal to P2 V2 to the five thirds. So PV to the five thirds is a constant. So that means that the derivative of that whole thing is what? Are you guys paying attention? Sleeping? Sorry, Amber Alert or something. Zero, right? If this is constant, then its derivative is zero. So we can rewrite this one as P times V times V to the two thirds. So we can do the, the product rule for three terms. This will be U, V, and W. And we get uh, P, V, dV to the two thirds plus V, V to the two thirds dP plus V to the two thirds P dV equals zero. Uh, so we have these V two thirds, V two thirds. I can factor it over here. This is, I'm gonna put this one first. PDV plus VDP. And then that other term, PV, DV to the th two thirds. What is this? PDV plus VDP. That is the derivative of PV. Uh, right, so we do the, dot, uh, the product rule over there. So 
So this one over here, we have the rule that d of x to the n dx is n times x minus one, right? We know that rule. So we can put the dx over here to get what dx to the n is. So that means that dv to the two thirds is two thirds v to the negative one third dv. So it's what we're gonna put over here. Two thirds v to the negative one third dv. And that is starting to look better. So this one we can write it as rewrite it. I'm gonna move the dv over here. V to the two thirds divided by V, right? That still, still gives us the V to the negative one third. So now we can get rid of these Vs. Okay, we're fixing it. Um, that whole thing is equal to zero. So then we can do two thirds of P V to the two thirds DV equals um, negative since we're moving it to the other side, V to the two thirds, um, derivative of PV. So we can get rid of the two thirds over here and over here, V to the two thirds. And finally, we get that P dV is minus three halves of the PV. That took some effort. Um, but now we can plug it in here for the work. So where's my, okay, I'm going to get rid of this part over here. So this is equal to minus three halves of mm, so PV is what? Yeah. 
and tau. N is a constant, so we can take it out. And so this is just a derivative of the temperature. So this is gonna be from temperature one to temperature two, the N, we can put it outside now. Well, that looks ugly. Anyways, N, D tau. So, the work is minus three halves N. In the temperature. Isn't that cool? So what is this quantity? That is the internal energy. So the difference in internal energy, U2 minus U1 is three half N. Tau two minus tau one. So the work is a change in the internal energy. That's a cool result. It has to be, right? Because uh, energy is conserved. negative change in internal energy. So if you look at the thermodynamic identity, in this case, the heat flow is zero because it was with an insulator so that means that the work over here is the change um, in the internal energy as expected. So conservation of energy, first law of thermodynamics. All right, last case. This is irreversible expansion into vacuums. We have a system, uh, the gas is over here. It is mm, inside of um, an insulator. So there's no heat that flows in or out. What is going to happen is that we're going to break a hole over here. And what is the gas going to do? Well, initially this was vacuum. Oh, 
What is the gas going to do? So afterwards, this whole thing is full. Yes, it will become less dense. So what is the work done by the gas? Options are zero, one, or infinity. <laughs> it is zero. Why? There was nothing to move. So the work done is zero. So this is actually the the more complicated case and we cannot study it uh, except in the final cases we cannot study uh, this scenario while the gas is flowing into the vacuum why because because it is not in in thermodynamic equilibrium right like this hole was rupturing to the wall. Uh, it's escaping rapidly. And so we are not like piecewise in thermodynamic equilibrium like in the other two cases. So there's no work done. There is no heat that flows in and out. Um, what is the internal energy of the gas? Before and after. Well, before is um, and tau one. What is what is the uh, internal energy afterwards? I guess at the end. and tau two, but there was no work done. I mean, no um, heat flowing in or out. So this temperature is the same. Now, that's a little bit non-intuitive that the temperature of the gas is going to be the same after it expands. But maybe it's only non-intuitive because we don't really see this scenario very often in real life. So there's no work done. So the uh, internal energy remains the same. So the temperature of the gas remains the same. Uh, the, the pressure uh, is going to change, but now the entropy It's going to be just like in the previous case, n, a natural log of V2 minus V1. Now, yeah, so there is a change in entropy. So if we look at the thermodynamic identity, This term is zero, this term is also zero. How come this one is not zero? Well, we're breaking it. The thermodynamic identity uh, holds when there is thermodynamic equilibrium and there was some um, there was a process you know, some time in which the system was not in thermodynamic 
uh, equilibrium. So this is the, the complicated one. Okay, so there's a table. Mm. The table is, like I said, right, didn't write the number, but It has uh, three processes that we saw. So reversible, isothermal, and we have reversible, isentropic, and irreversible. And it is irreversible because there was a change uh, in entropy. We cannot, if, if we do work in order to put the system, well, in order to put the system back into its original position, so all the gas in the smaller chamber, we have to do work on the system. So, you know, when we do that, we create heat and we pay the price of the of the entropy. So we have the change in the energy. So for this one, zero. For this one is zero. The internal the energy came from the reservoir. This one did have to do. Um, they'd have to do work. And then the delta sigma, the entropy, this one had no change in entropy by definition. And then for both of these, we have the natural log of the ratio of the volumes. And then the work, um, this one did no work because there was nothing there. And the works were different for isothermal and isentropic. Isentropic was more complicated because of the relationship uh, P B to the 5 thirds constant instead of PV constant. And the heat that flew into the system, nothing here it was uh, isolated. Uh, here also nothing. And here, uh, n tau, natural log of the ratio of the volumes. This heat came from, from the reservoir. So these are the main uh, characteristics of the three processes. And if you think, for example, about you know piston in uh, an engine, like in a car or something, you have a combination of this one. So if you move like slowly enough, any line that you trace for a for a thermodynamic process is going to be kind of a combination of these two. If you move really slowly, you know, in an idealized case. All right, so that was the end of chapter six. So let's look uh, very quickly at a few definitions for chapter seven. So the name of chapter seven is Fermi
and both gases. So in chapter six, we were looking at Fermi and Bose gases, but in the classical limit. And now we're going to see them in the quantum limit. So if you remember, uh, uh, this plot for the distribution function for Fermi Dirac, look like that. For Bose Einstein, it looks like that. And this was the classical limit. So in the classical limit, it doesn't matter if they're fermions or bosons, they behave the same. And well, they behave like the ideal gases we just analyzed. If we move closer to this mu, then the behavior of the bosons and the fermions is very, very different. And it's also very different from the behavior that both have in the classical regime. So what is the quantum concentration? We have been talking about it forever. What is your understanding? The way I think about it, you, know, you can have a, a volume of particles and you know we know from quantum mechanics that everything has a wavelength and um, sort of wave function and so if you could look at particles of gas or particles of human whatever uh, material uh, they will look kind of like these right kind of like wave functions Maybe you'll have one here, one here and another one over here but because in this case and this is the classical regime the concentration of the particles each is much smaller than the quantum concentration then they almost never see each other and most of the time they're just like moving around um, you do not need to look at the actual structure of the wave function of these particles because classical mechanics tells you everything that you need to know about how they're going to So the, the quantum concentration and you know, the way I think about it, it's like a, it's a smaller box, you know, it's kind of like the space that the particle occupies. So and this is another one. If you start to put a bunch of particles in here, you, know, you increase the concentration by a lot actually you increase it by enough that you increase it enough that n is now equal and the quantum concentration then these wave functions are going to start, you know, overlapping with each other because they cannot go other places. Right? So we're going to have a, a mess over here. If the wave functions are overlapping, so if you have, you know, one of one particle occupying and getting inside of the quantum space of another a particle then you are in this quantum regime, right? So, 
one of the examples that we saw recently in the in the literature discussions was about the black hole. Right? So in a black hole, you have a lot of pressure, quantum regime. Uh, you also have a lot of um, mass, and so you need general relativity. Uh, those two theories, general relativity is classical, and quantum is quantum. They are not compatible, so that's why we don't have a theory for how black holes work. So you can increase, uh, you, you can go into the quantum regime by increasing the concentration a lot. Is there another way to you know, get to the quantum regime? Yes, so the other way, Um, is with the temperature, right? So there is some critical temperature. Um, that temperature is two pi h bar squared over m to the two thirds, you know, n to the two thirds. Um, you can get to the quantum regime by decreasing the temperature a lot. So, you know, get close to one Kelvin, zero Kelvin. Why? Well, remember that when the temperature decreases, the wavelength of the particles increases. Okay, so the, you don't know their velocity very well. I mean, the velocity is really low. So then you don't know the position very well. That's, uh, you can also get it from the uncertainty principle. So at very low temperatures, even if you don't, if, even if your concentration is not that high, the wave functions are going to start to be really, really low. I mean, uh, long, right? So they will start, they, they will go into the quantum regime. So there's a lot of very interesting uh, physics in here. So uh, uh, bosons, they're all going to move to the, to the ground state. All of the bosons are going to be in the ground state. And you have things like superconductivity and you know, superfluidity. And since it is a, bosonic quantum effect, that's why you need low temperatures for superconductivity. But for fermions, what they're gonna do is that they're going to start to stack on top of each other, right? Because they cannot occupy the same quantum numbers. So uh, they're going to have more and more energy as they are, uh, as if you have more particles, they cannot all fall to the ground state, the ground state of the system, the ground state orbital. The ground state will be, you know, they arrange themselves one on top of each other. Uh, that has interesting um, consequences. So it turns out that metals, any metal that you can touch with your hand, it's in a quantum state. You know, the electrons are very close to being to their ground state of the system. Um, and the physics that describes metals is the same physics that describes white dwarfs and neutron stars and the nucleus of the atom is the same physics. So uh, we're going to analyze you know, metals and, and white dwarfs, and these are cool, cool cases. And when you have a system, so a Fermi gas or a Bose gas that is in the quantum state, it is called a, a degenerate gas. So degenerate as opposed to how we use it at the beginning of the semester, which meant that you had more than one state 
um, for a particular energy. Here, the generative means that is very close to uh, quantum. Oh, it is in its quantum uh, state. All right. And I think that's all I wanted to say about that. So I'm going to stop recording any questions.